hope that we would talk more about health care. I hope we would talk more about class issues in this country. Um, I hope that we would talk more about a social safety net. You know, there are many aspects, many wings of the gay, lesbian, and queer movement who are very concerned with racial justice issues, with class issues. Those issues have not been emphasized because of the uh, dominance of the marriage question. Mm -hmm. So I would like this to shift the terms of the debate. And instead of talking about marriage as an equality issue, I would like to talk about marriage as a political economic issue, as a form of governance. And I would like us to evaluate that institution based on how we would evaluate other forms of governance. Mm -hmm. Are they fair? Mm -hmm. Do they treat people equally? And if we do that, our conclusion would have to be no. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. The Gay Liberation Front of the 1970s had a radical vision of a world, a vision which did not seek to reform the institute of marriage to allow them in. Rather, they and other radical left gay activists called for a complete revolution of traditional family structures. On the question of gays in the military, they did not, they did not demand to be allowed in, uh, but rather critiqued the military and developed anti-war views. So we ask, how did the left gay radical movement move from a rejection of the institute of marriage to seeing marriage as the single most important insurer of equity for gay, lesbian, queer, transgendered, and questioning people? Today we welcome Assistant Professor of Sociology at Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, J.C. Whitehead. J.C. is the author of Nuptial Deal, Same-Sex Marriage, and Neoliberal Governance. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Good, good. So let's just start with that question I just posed. Uh, how, do, how did we move from a gay uh, movement uh, that essentially rejected the idea of marriage to one that uh, sees it as the litmus test for equity for gay, gay people? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and, it's, and I'm not the first one to pose it. Um, and in fact, there are historical analyses that look at sort of the dynamics of the movement itself over time, and also pressures from the religious right that sort of maybe pushed the movement in the direction of marriage. But my spin on the question is to look at it in terms of the broader context of the meaning of marriage and the importance of marriage in contemporary American life. And so the answer to the question is, gay, gays and lesbians and the mainstream movement began to pursue marriage because marriage has become more important. In a context where we have a dwindling social safety net and there is more emotional investment into the institution of marriage. Okay, a a and so uh, t talk about this idea of the neoliberal governance. What, what, what is that referring to? Sure, and I'm glad you asked that because a lot of times when people say the term neoliberal, it connotes a lot of different mm -hmm. things uh, yeah, because I, people I think use it. it yeah, it, it does uh, for a lot of people. They're going yeah. to be scratching their head. What, what is she talking yeah, about? Yeah, what is she talking about? Right, and, uh -huh. and essentially what I'm, what I'm referring to is a political economic situation, contemporary situation, where we have more investment, public investment in privates than we do in communities or the public. So it it's refers to the dwindling of a social safety net in the United States. At the same time, we have privatized a lot of things that earlier we would have considered community and social functions. So the way I look at marriage is it is a form of governance, a way of governing that allows a shift in responsibility from these governing functions like managing the health and economic instability of a society, shifting that responsibility from the state to individual couples and saying things like unemployment and ill health are things that you as a couple should manage instead of the state, mm -hmm. right? And as you and I know, being students of sociology, of course, the state, the whole, one of the purposes of the state is to manage things that we as individuals cannot. And those things include things like health of a population or economic structures that individuals themselves, we can make all the right decisions we want to, but we'll never be able to control unemployment. We'll never be able to control large scale health 
dynamics. Mm -hmm. From the time that I was growing up, the state was seen as at least playing a large role in helping individuals when they encountered problems like, well, well like uh, health problems or employment problems. But that's changed. And that has impacted uh, uh, gay people in searching for marriage as a, as a solution. Yeah, I think that's the big picture. Um, and in fact, I think that when you look at marriage equality activism, as I have, pretty intensively for, for a period of almost two years, you can see that the message is one about how can we as a family gain access to those structures that allow people to manage life risks in a situation or a context where you can't rely on publics, you can't rely on the state. Okay, talk, talk about in the 70s and the, um, the, the Gay uh, Liberation Alliance. Uh, they had this critique of family structures, uh, tra traditional family structures. Mm -hmm. What did they want to see instead? Yeah, there was very much a vision that gays and lesbians had something to offer that straights didn't understand. That there was a way of experiencing intimacy beyond the confines of marriage, and in some cases monogamy, that allowed you more freedom of expression, that was uh, more egalitarian in terms of gender and class equalities. And so they, uh, they saw in the institution of marriage as, as a straight or heterosexist and even patriarchal institution that gay and lesbians themselves didn't belong in and had better options. Uh, yeah, I actually, you'll, because that's when I grew up, as the, and that is uh, almost exactly the way I felt about marriage. It was like, wow, it is so male dominated and so oriented toward um, uh, assuring male authority uh, that that did not speak to me at all, particularly thinking in terms of, of uh, growing older and, and being in a relationship with, with another man. It was like, well, those, those kind of values didn't speak to me at all. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's where I was at ne then. Now, however, uh, I I and this has changed over years, and I've been pretty much unconscious of it, uh, where I really th see great value in being married. Um, it's talk about uh, that absolutely. change over time. Sure, and that's that's not an illusion, right? It's mm -hmm. not like you have become falsely conscious, you know, of this institution. Mm -hmm. It's because you're you are at a point in your life, like many gays and lesbians, or our society is in a point of its history where having access to those mechanisms for managing life risks become ever more important, and we have become more attuned to risk as a population, you know, we're very concerned. Every, many of the things that we do are about managing what could, ha you know, the bad things that could happen, the disastrous results of something, and we've, we very much have that mentality toward living life. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not surprising. Um, and in fact, many of, of the same kinds of pressures that heterosexual couples face are the same pressures that gays and lesbians face, although for gays and lesbians this is often magnified by you know, being a stigmatized population and also not having legal rights for your, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to your children, for example, mm -hmm. parental yeah. rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, on, the, on the back cover of your book, Wendy Brown states, the nuptial deal exposes the quest for marriage as a conservative risk management project. So that's what we've been talking about. Uh, one that leaves those outside its orbit even more vulnerable in the context of intensifying neoliberal inequalities. So these, this uh, context of intensifying neoliberal inequalities, flush that out for us. Yeah, as I understand it, it's, it, these are things that you talk about on your program probably pretty regularly, which are efforts to take um, publicly funded projects, for example, and to siphon those off to private um, realms. So, so publicly funded projects. Right. So for example, um, if you're thinking about sort of as a taxpayer, where is my money going, right? Instead of that money going into supporting public things like 
your post office or public hospitals, right? That we have been moving toward funneling those funds into private sources to manage those things um, for profits, mm -hmm. right? For example, mm -hmm. so that's that's what Wendy Brown is referring to when she's talking about this neoliberal project that is is has been siphoning off a sense of public and community resources to private hands, where profit becomes the logic rather than well-being of citizens, right? Which is the problem with that model, for example, with post offices, right? So when it becomes unprofitable, then there's no reason to have a post office in a small yeah. town. It's the mm -hmm. same kind of logic where you base your governance and your social policy on the logic of profit rather than citizen well-being. And that's essentially what I'm talking about when it comes to marriage, except you're thinking about basing intimate decisions on and family formations on shifting that responsibility to individual couples rather than a larger commitment to the mm -hmm. public. Okay, all right. And, and so this is, this is really kind of um, a process in which uh, individuals have become itemized. Uh, is that the right word? Um, um, insulated from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and insulated from the larger society in the state. And we're each told that we're responsible for all of our own well-being. Right, right. And maybe to be more concrete, a way to look at it is through an example. Mm -hmm. So um, for a lot of the marriage equality activists that I talk with, they would discuss access to health insurance as one of the main reasons why they wanted to get married to their partner. Mm -hmm. Completely logical, right? It mm -hmm. makes sense. Because if you have access to marriage, then you have access to your partner's health insurance. Now, you could look at that and say, well, in this, this way that we've structured health insurance, that's the smart decision to make. But what if your argument instead was, hey, we should have a system where you don't have to depend on just one person to get access to health insurance. It shouldn't be based on your relationship status, but it should really be based on the fact that you are a citizen of this country or some other thing that is based on your being a human being, mm -hmm. you know, rather than mm -hmm. subscribing to this particular kind of intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. So one of the main conclusions of my book then is we need to uncouple the intimacy aspects of our relationships and marriage from the governing function of family institutions because when we confuse the two of those, we no longer evaluate marriage as a practice of governance, but we evaluate it emotionally. Mm -hmm. And that makes it difficult for us to make good decisions, good social policy decisions. Right, yeah. And from those in the 70s, they really wanted to do that. Yes. They really wanted to separate those two. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. And so um, you've given us an example in terms of health care where moving away from this neoliberal institution of marriage uh, could be done. Uh, so you've suggested um, uh, something that I always advocate for, which would be like a single-payer health care system mm -hmm. where everybody was covered uh, so that it wasn't dependent on uh, who you were married to. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Can you give some other examples of... of uh, of, um, of ways that that could happen? Sure, other examples of, of how marriage is integrated into this concept of managing risk, so. Yeah, yeah. and then how, how do we recreate that so that uh, they become separate again? Oh, sure, so one example, uh, another example besides health that I use a lot is in terms of unemployment, right? And this risk that you're going to, as as many of us experience, because when you're middle class or working class in the United States, oftentimes you're one paycheck away from being in this kind of chaos situation, right? Mm -hmm. So what I look at is for gays and lesbians in the movement who were really trying to get access to marriage, part of it was about having that security of you have that other person that's there with you through sickness and in health, right? Mm -hmm. Who is going to be there if you lose your job. It's you know, not just some commitment they made to you personally, but it's enforced through the state that they will be there for you as that um, support system, which, as I mentioned before, is very important when you have such a weak social safety net like we do in the United States. Now, one way of looking at that is to say that's why we need marriage, is so we can have access to this institution. Another way of looking at it is to say that is uh, illogical and unfair 
that we would ask one other individual to be that one person to provide a safety net. When we know mm -hmm. that there are so many couples and so many Americans who are sort of on this brink, and we know that there isn't much of a social safety net for those folks. In this way, marriage becomes more of a compulsory institution where we feel like we have to enter it if we want to have that security, stability, and safety that goes along with that institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it really seems like um, um, marriage in and of itself doesn't have uh, a lot of attractions except that uh, it provides us with the safety net. That's part of the story. The other part of the story is we sentimentalize marriage as a population. And this is also true for gays and lesbians who w w grow up watching the same Disney movies, mm -hmm. who think the same way about the power of actually having somebody say, you, you know, I now pronounce you. Um, in the data that I collected in the interviews I did in my time with uh, marriage activists, that was the thing that really sealed the deal for them. That's the difference uh, for them. One of the big differences between domestic partnerships and marriage is to have that special seal that only the state can provide by saying, you are a prized couple. And this has implications for your family, the way your family treats you, but also for the way your society treats you. So for many of the activists I talked with, this meant that society now was telling them that they were just as legitimate, just as prized and important as straight people and their couples. One of my respondents uh, talked about how when he had the opportunity to get married, because it's happened in pockets of the country, right? There's mm -hmm. this brief period of time where gay people could marry. Yeah. He was one of these people. And he said when he actually heard that he was pronounced as spouse, that he felt for the first time that he was accepted as a gay man in America, mm -hmm. right? That yes. was the uh, first right. time uh -huh. that he really felt mm -hmm. like this country mm -hmm. valued his humanity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about dollars and cents. It's not just about gaining access to resources. But marriage, the reason why it's so powerful is because it has this symbolic effect. Mm -hmm. And it reverberates through our relationships with family, friends. I had respondents talk about how they would go to the farmer's market after they were married and they would have complete strangers walk up to them and say, congratulations, oh, mm -hmm. can I give you a hug? Mm -hmm. That's marriage. Mm -hmm. That's a feeling that comes with it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the arguments I make is that's what makes it such a powerful form of governance is because we don't see it as government. We mm -hmm. see it as love. Mm -hmm. We see it as family. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, discuss this difference between government and governance. Oh, that's a great question. So when you hear government, you might think of politicians, the state, or the subject of governing populations, right? When you think of governance, it's about a practice, a way of solving a series of problems that come with populations. So when I say governance, I'm taking it away from this idea that only states or governments do this kind of thing but families do it too, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. practice governance. And when we start to see families as ways of regulating or managing problems of the population, like illness and unemployment or poverty, then we can begin to evaluate, is this a democratic mm -hmm. or fair way of governing? Mm -hmm. And my conclusion is no, it is not. You know, uh, when, uh, when we first talked about doing this interview, I asked you to send me some, some questions. And so uh, one of the questions you suggested was, can you explain why or how uh, neoliberalism is relevant to, to marriage promotion? Right, and actually that's, that's what we've been talking about. We, we have been, uh, in, yeah. In terms of marriage operating as a form of governance and not just a personal commitment or a mm -hmm. kind of relationship that marriage has been with us before neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. But as other aspects of our society has shifted with the increasing privatization, so has marriage. Mm -hmm. So has marriage shifted in terms of how it functions within this broader political economic climate. Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's operating as the last lifeboat, I argue, the last lifeboat in sort of a sea of, of drowning social safety nets 
You know, you don't really have that much to hang on to mm -hmm. if, you're, mm -hmm. if you're drowning. But marriage is one of those institutions that, that we uphold and say, you know, this is what you should be doing to have a stable life. You should get married. And you and your partner together, if you make good decisions, mm -hmm. you can make it through life's inevitable ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, yeah. And of course, uh, for my partner and I have been together for 20 years. You know, so uh, we have that informal commitment that marriage itself is it, it's just not required. But the other benefits are very attractive for actually being officially married. Right. right yeah. So uh, early on in the conversation, you, you said something about um, uh, this shift from the 70s perspective on marriage to our present fixation on it mm -hmm. uh, as in part being a result or a reaction to right wing uh, political campaigns directed against gays. Can you elaborate on that? It's not my particular field of expertise, but, but I'm thinking of, for example, mid 80s or early 80s um, right-wing family protection kinds of arguments of uh, making uh, scapegoating gays and lesbians for um, uh, attacking heterosexual straight families and there's sort of a, a reaction on the part of mainstream uh, gay and lesbian organizations to sort of capture that and say well we are the marry marrying kind as well mm -hmm. the issue is much more complex than that and there are many good books that, that give the details of how that worked out um, but one of the points that we should, we should think about is marriage is not inevitable. It's not an inevitable cause for gays and lesbians because there was a point in the late 70s where we were looking at other avenues for changing the law in a way that would create more family diversity, that would create different ways that you could be parents rather than just through the marriage relationship. These were underway, but there were shifts that happen in terms of pressures from the religious right um, that, that and, and it's sort of the easiness, the ease of going the marriage route that, that pushed us in that direction. Mm -hmm. But it's not inevitable. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. Just as a, just as kind of an aside from your book, one of the things that I felt was really encouraging, and it kind of goes back to the 70s model of uh, joining issues together, was the uh, I think this happened in Oregon in just a few days ago. My memory, my short-term memory is, is uh, not kicking in here. Uh, but I, I, it was a, uh, a CASA uh, e event uh, with regard to immigration. And there was a lesbian couple that went to that immigration um, event uh, and got married. And I thought, what a wonderful joining of those two mm -hmm. issues. Yes, because it highlights the compulsory nature of marriage. Mm -hmm. If you and your partner want to stay in this country, you need to get married. Yes. Right? Right. And all the while, we like to talk about how marriage is freely chosen. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it on the institutional level, there are all kinds of pressures that don't give people a whole lot of choice. Mm -hmm. right. You know, this, this, is, this is an issue that's becoming, um, for our neighbors to the north in Washington state, this is becoming a real issue for them because there are many couples who have domestic partnerships. Well, what happens in that state where same-sex marriage becomes legal? Can you keep your domestic partnership? No. You no. have two choices. No. You can be divorced or you can be married. Mm -hmm. You don't get to choose. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, and, th and then like the immigration question, this is another way we can see marriage operating more like an authoritarian form of governance, mm -hmm. right? One mm -hmm. that doesn't give you a whole lot of choice, mm -hmm. one you feel like you have to, right? Yeah, okay, very interesting. What did, you, uh, what did you hope, or how did you hope with this book to change the conversation about marriage? I hope that we would talk more about healthcare. I hope we would talk more about class issues in this country. Um, I hope that we would talk more about a social safety net you know, there are many aspects, many wings of the gay, lesbian, and queer movement who are very concerned with racial justice issues, with class issues. Those issues have not been emphasized because of the uh, dominance of the marriage question. Mm -hmm. So I would like this to shift the terms of the debate 
And instead of talking about marriage as an equality issue, I would like to talk about marriage as a political economic issue, as a form of governance. And I would like us to evaluate that institution based on how we would evaluate other forms of governance. Mm -hmm. Are they fair? Mm -hmm. Do they treat people equally? And if we do that, our conclusion would have to be no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a whole different consideration, a whole different set of considerations. Right. Yeah. Well, our time is up, unfortunately. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Great, good. So our guest today has been J.C. Whitehead, assistant uh, professor of sociology at Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, and author of The, Nu the Nuptial Deal, uh, Same-Sex Marriage and Neoliberal Governance. In 2008, Tim DeChristopher committed an act of civil disobedience civil disobedience when he bid millions of dollars he didn't have in a BLM land auction in order to prevent oil and gas exploitation in the rock, in the Red Rock Pacific lands of Utah. As Beth Gage, the director of the new documentary Bitter 70 says, Tim DeChristopher is a young man with a message that needs to be heard. Climate change is upon us. And there's nothing, there is nothing more important to work for than a livable future. Join the Alliance for Democracy for a screening of this new documentary, Bitter 70, that follows Tim from being a college student to being an incarcerated felon. Here in Portland, that screening will be on Friday, March 8th, starting at 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church, Southwest 12th and Salmon in downtown Portland. But if you're not in Portland, check to see if it might be scheduled in your town or schedule a screening yourself. Visit their website at www.bitter70film.com. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more about the National Alliance for Democracy at thealliancefordemocracy.org or Portland website at, pdx, at afd-pdx.org. I want to thank our crew today for getting us on the air again. So thank you to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Brad Leach, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to the staff here at Portland Community Media for the use of their facilities, their studios, and also their advice on how, how we're able to get on the air. Thanks to the audience for, for joining us, and I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.